Hello everyone, this is Jan Kabili, your host for the Photoshop Show. This is episode 40 of the Photoshop Show and we're really honored tonight to have a friend of mine, Chris Meyer, as our special guest. Chris is a great photographer, he is a fine artist, and he uses Photoshop in his artwork. So tonight he's going to show us how he does that and he's going to show us some of his, what do we call them Chris, paintings or Photoshop, what, what do you call those things you make? I refer to it as hybrid art because it's a combination of digital photography and digital printing with a normal analog art, ma art making process. Well, I think that's really cool. Um, my first introduction to Photoshop myself was through art because I was in art school and it wasn't enough to just have a photo. We had to make something out of our photos. And, you know, it's so much fun to do that in Photoshop. And you've done some really beautiful work um, that reflects your environment because you're down in, where, you live in Santa Fe, right? I live a little south of Santa Fe, but in general, I love going around the Four Corners region of the Southwest. It's a lot of great colors, lots of great shapes and rocks. Well, I can't wait to see your work. So we'll come back to you in just a little while and take a look at what you've got and hear from you as well. Okay. And in our panel, who else do we have? Who's next to me down there? It's me, Erica Thornis, and I'm based out of San Diego, and I'm looking forward to the show tonight. I'm a photographer. <laughs> <laughs> I know you are. <laughs> and who else is down there? And I'm Dave Bell. For some reason, my lower thirds isn't working, so you can't see my name there, but uh, Dave Bell is my name. I'll be watching the chat room um, for any questions that uh, anyone might have for Chris. And uh, great to be here again tonight. And just to remind people, how do they get to the chat room if they want to participate? Uh, in, the, uh, in the Photoshop show event, you'll see the link, and I've pasted it a couple times right in the show event. If you read the description of the event, there's a link that will take you to our live chat room. You don't need to put any sort of login if you don't want to. You can just uh, start, um, just make up a name that you want to use and start typing and join in. Well, great. I hope everybody does that because that's the whole point of a Hangout is to bring in as many folks as we can. So always at the beginning of the show, I show a quick uh, tutorial and I've got a really quick one for you tonight, I promise. So I'm going to share my screen and show you a quick tip in Lightroom. Can you see my Lightroom catalog now? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. <laughs> yes. Can you see Lightroom? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. So I'm working in Lightroom 5, but this isn't just a Lightroom 5 tip. It goes back at least one version and maybe more. And that is, um, first of all, let me ask you, do you guys use keywords in Lightroom? Absolutely. Yes, uh, yes I do. But still somewhat of a mess that I need to go back and fix. Well, everybody says that. They're like, yeah, use keywords, but oh my God, it's a mess. And so that's exactly what I wanted to talk about tonight, is to show you a way to help you to fix your keyword mess. Everybody's got a keyword mess. Even if you try really hard, it's almost impossible not to end up with things like keywords that you haven't applied to any photos, that somehow just got in there and just got lost in the long list of keywords. And I have some like that over here in the keyword list in this catalog in my places um, category that I've made. I see that I've got zero photos taken in Buffalo, thank God. <laughs> That's where I grew up, so I can say that. And zero photos taken in Toronto, but yet I have those keywords in there. God knows where they came from. So what, and, and I'm likely to have lots of those in my main catalog where I've got hundreds and hundreds of keywords. So I found something in Lightroom that really helped me out. I just stumbled upon it. I was looking through the menus one day and I found that if you go up to the metadata menu, and I'm in the library module as I'm doing this, by the way. If you go up to the metadata menu and you go all the way to the very bottom, look what's there. Purge unused keywords. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> so how cool. So watch, if I do purge unused my, um, ugh, if I do click purge unused keywords, in just a moment, those keywords for Buffalo and Toronto are gone from my keyword list and the keyword list is a lot more manageable. It's not bloated with keywords that I really don't need and I'm, and I'm not using anymore. So isn't that nice? That's nice. That's cool. Yeah. Now, I know there are some keyword lists that you can like import, like some people have come up with like good sets of lists that you can use. Right, there are there are some that you can buy. There are a couple of free ones online, and I'm taking a look at them. And to be honest, they don't work for me. And the reason is my brain is unique, and everybody's is unique. And the way I think about my photos is different, maybe than 
some sort of dictionary hierarchy of words. And so I really urge you to, um, when you make up keywords, think about how you think about and look for your photos. And that's how you should come up with your keywords. It's not um, an exercise in, uh, in English grammar. It's about how Jan Kabili thinks about her photos. So I decided, and I've said this before, that I'm going to either look for things by place, things, people, or techniques. Those are my four main categories of keywords. And everything that I do fits in there. And things is kind of a catch-all. You know, so yeah. there's hats and cars and boats um, and places. Venice, Paris, Boulder, and techniques. This is uh, these are keyworded with the Silver Effects Pro um, keyword in techniques because that's what I use to make these black and whites. And that's enough for me. You don't have to have a million keywords on everything. You just have to have words that trigger something for you and are meaningful for you. What do you think about that? You guys agree with that? Absolutely. But I've never actually had mine sorted. I've always they're always in one big jumble. Well, I found out, Erica, that it helps to sort them just because it keeps the keyword list short. Well, and it does. I just never bothered. So I'm really glad to see this. Well, it's kind of a pain. It's one more thing to do because you have to keep dragging. New keywords have to go in the right categories. But then, see, I can collapse the categories like this, and I have a really short list. And then if I want to find a keyword, by the way, there is a search field at the top of the keyword list panel, and I can search in there. I want to see all the keywords that might have car, and it goes right to my cars keyword or any others that have those That's letters. Really nice. I, I yeah. like that so you don't accidentally get multiple versions of what essentially is the same concept. I need, I need to spend more time on that part of, of, photo, of Lightroom and it's hard. I get so eager to see my photos that I spend less time organizing than I should. Of course, and that's really typical, and there's nothing weird or strange um, about that. I think that's probably true of the majority of people out there. So I'm going to unscreen, unscreen share. What were you going to say, Chris? I say it's really useful for me to learn because I have to admit I'm one of the people who's not gotten into Lightroom yet, but I'd like to. So I'm still pushing along in Bridge and just <sighs> using numbers and colors and otherwise using folders to keep myself sorted. So that's definitely another reason to move to Lightroom. Well, you know what, though? If it works for you, if it's not broken, you don't need to fix it. And Bridge certainly has worked for a lot of people for a long time. Yeah, I'm used to it because I do try to catalog all my photos in the evening after every photo shoot, at least to throw out the bad ones and make some very quick selects. And I'm just used to using Bridge for that, but I need to, I need to migrate. Well, it's a real different system. So if you're going to, um, I would invite you to look at my <laughs> course called Up and Running with Lightroom 5. <laughs> I, I plan on it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I went to all kinds of trouble, though, really, to try to make it relatively easy for a real human being to get started using Lightroom because, my God, I mean, you know, you, there's so much. It's like Photoshop. You could go on and on forever. And you don't need to know everything at once to get started. So go look at that and you'll be okay. Oh, and that reminds me, um, before I get off stage, I wanted to tell you guys that this week um, Photoshop Elements 12 was released by Adobe. And um, you've, we've had Elements on the show before. David Biedney was showing us cool stuff you can do in there. And um, whenever Elements comes out, I get to do the Elements courses at lynda.com. And so I am in the middle of doing a big course on uh, Photoshop Elements 12 Essential Training. And they already released my initial introductory course about it called Up and Running with Photoshop Elements 12. So if you're interested, go take a look at that. You know, you can see what the new features are. And also, uh, you know, it's, it's supposed to be a bite-sized course, that up and running course, to get you going st uh, using that program. OK, so that's it. That's what I have. What do you got, Chris? Well, I'm going to share a little bit of my background first and where I came from. And then I'm going to actually show my process of how I create these pieces of artwork. I'm going to talk a little bit of the macro view of how the pieces are constructed. Then I'm going to spend some time diving into Adobe Camera Raw to show how I would edit these images to make my pieces of artwork. Then I'll go back on camera and I actually have a couple of pieces here with me. I want to show some alternate ideas for how you can mount photography, not in the traditional matte and glass, but directly on the wooden panels. I'm so, so excited about that part. That's, that's going to be fascinating to me. Yeah, because it's really particularly one of the reasons I moved to New Mexico was to get near the gallery scene in Santa Fe, et cetera. And there is a strong push towards a more modern appearance of less frame around your images, even less glass in front of the images, and just presenting it in a very straight, on-panel sort of modern appearance. So mm -hmm. for particularly for people interested in getting into galleries and selling their artwork, you need to keep up with trends like that of how to present your artwork. And that's one of the things I want to talk about. Fabulous. So my background, I come from 
a series of industries. I actually worked in the music industry for a while, uh, designing musical instruments and designing digital audio recorders and also playing music. But about 20 some odd years ago, there was a big change happening over in the video and film world where it became possible to do on desktop computers what used to literally require million dollar pieces of machines to do. This was a big sea change in the video industry. And that program was now known as Adobe After Effects. Back then it was called Coast After Effects. And my wife Trish and I were two of the original beta testers for version one of After Effects back in 92. And we got to ride that whole wave. And since then we've written 12 books. We have over 40 courses on lynda.com and using After Effects, etc. So we've done a lot of stuff for major motion pictures and television and trade shows, but they're all client work and ultimately you have to subsume your creative vision to the client's creative vision and the message they need to get across. You know, it's commercial art. And that kind of left my wife Trish and I wanting cases where we were the client. We did not have to compromise an artistic vision. So several years ago, as a hobby, and also to better talk to art directors, et cetera, we started getting into fine art. And I've been pursuing that now as um, my next career after video and film, is wanting to create fine art. It's given me an opportunity to combine what I normally do with computers. I've been a photographer since I was a kid with traditional art techniques and create this thing I call hybrid art. So what I want to do is just show some of the things I do with art and what I'm looking for inside photos, then actually go through my process and give you an idea there. So hang on a second while I screen share, and I'm going to well, show you. Go ahead. While he's screen sharing, I want to say um, the way that I know Chris is this is a famous guy. He has literally written, what did you say, 12 books and done so many different courses. So if you are looking for information on After Effects, which is a whole other subject, this is the man. And it's not just the man, it's half of a team because his wife Trish is, um, you know, his other half both in life and at work. And, you know, and, and a better, a bigger expert you will never find in After Effects than that guy sitting right there. But now he's going to show us his other life too. Yeah, we've had the advantage of learning After Effects slowly over 20 years. You know, it's all easier to take in that way instead of trying to learn it all in a few months. But that's what training's for. Anyway, I want to start off by sharing. This is a photo I took when I was in single digits of years. I don't even remember how old I was back then. But this gives an idea of the photography I was taking since I was a toddler, practically. This is an Instamatic camera put on the side of the vehicle assembly building at Cape Canaveral. And ever since I was young, I wasn't so interested in taking traditional landscape or portrait photography. I was interested in abstract photography, getting rid of the sense of perspective, reducing the image just down to shapes, lines, colors, and working in a truly abstract, abstract mode with photography. And this is something from 45 years ago I took, and I still have that image I took. But I want to give you an idea first of the type of imagery I'm creating, then start breaking down how I create it. Here's some recent work that I've created. And you'll notice that these have a lot of very organic elements to them, but they're also very abstracted. Every one of these images has started life as a photograph. None of this is computer generated. None of this is painting, particularly in Photoshop. But there are definitely elements of paint in every one of these images. And you'll see there's a lot of other layering going on as well. And I'll talk about that in a second. What I like to do is I like to go hiking around California in the Four Corners, um, Utah, Arizona, Colorado, New Mexico, looking for interesting rocks and geology. And I'm looking in particular for interesting shapes, interesting patterns of lines, interesting balance inside the image. Basically, the rules of composition, but completely abstracted. And that's my starting point for creating these works. What I'll do then is then I'll treat the photograph of these abstracted rocks to pull out all of these colors and more contrast. And then I will create a collage, torn pieces of paper glued down into a stiff board that matches the shapes that were present in the original photograph. After I have those shapes done as a collage, I'll then actually print the photograph on top of the collage. And I'll break down exactly what I mean by that and how I go about doing that. When I'm done merging those two together, the photograph and the collage underneath, these get mounted onto wood panels, and then I add additional elements on top. For example, this one is a story about how coyote brought fire to humans. So I have a coyote foot bone as part of the assemblage for this particular piece. 
So I like to include physical elements that relate to the story that's inside the photographs of these works. This is one about the very beginning, a creation story about when we originally came out of the water and lost our tails, etc. Wait, I did not have a tail. <laughs> <laughs> According to certain Indian tribes, yes, you did, in the time before the beginning, as they call it. So that's some examples of work. So let me break down how one of these come together, and then I'll actually show you my source photography and how I will treat a raw image inside Adobe Camera Raw. And I'll start with one of those last ones I showed. This is an example of a rock that I photographed in Escalante Petrified Forest up in Utah. Everyone knows the famous National Petrified Forest in Arizona, but there is another lesser known one up in Utah as well. And in addition to looking for petrified logs, there was a lot of interesting rocks up there and lichen formations and things like that. So this is an example of just a rock underground while we were hiking. And immediately what I saw in this caught my eye were these various dots, which reminded me of almost like a binary dot digital sort of imagery. Some interesting shapes of this island surrounded by this moat, heavier shapes to the outside, etc. After I take a shot like that, and I do try to frame these things in the camera as close as I can get them, but I always try to take more image than I need so I can go ahead and crop and play around with it later. This is an example of that image treated in Adobe Camera Raw. Now there's no painting that went on with this image. Now, all the colors you, saw, you see in this image were present in the original photo. The reason I can get those colors is I shoot everything using camera raw on my camera. And for those of you who are relative beginners at this, the two pieces of advice I would give you is get a camera that can shoot in raw so you can get all the information on your sensor and pull out these subtle colors that are present in the image but which may not be visible initially to the naked eye. And two, take all your photos in camera raw. I mean, yes, it takes up a lot more space on your card. You're going to be swapping cards more often. You're going to need more drives to back up your data. But really, Adobe, using Camera Raw for your photos really pays off later. Now, you may ask whether or not I use HDR instead. All these photos are taken while I'm out hiking in the back of beyond with 30 pounds of camera equipment on my back, and I'm taking them while other people are hiking, wanting me to catch up with them. So I can't really stop, put it on a tripod, take three images of different exposures. I use Camera Raw to give me all that dynamic range to pull this out of the image. Or you can be like me and use Lightroom, which uses the same process. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons I want to migrate to Lightroom is because I think I'm going to be able to take advantage of all of my chops from the Camera Raw dialog, but use them in the better cataloging structure of Lightroom. So once I have an image like this, I'll create a very faint version of it and print it onto a piece of paper. And that piece of paper becomes a guide to make a collage where I tear up different pieces of paper to match the shapes that were present in the original photo. Now this one has a variety of different types of papers. Um, at the very top of the image and in a triangle at the lower left and kind of in the mid right are three different tears of one identical piece of Japanese paper. In the upper left and lower right are some hand tinted papers I made myself using an old oriental process called splash ink where I get very thin Chinese papers, throw pigments into a vat of water with the paper, let the water evaporate and it leaves these patterns inside the paper. And I get other papers too like the ones in the upper right and in the mid left are mica paper. It's actually a mulberry type of paper with mica flakes embedded in it. And that will create things that are very reflective. So you have differences in texture and difference in reflectivity, which is a completely different way of viewing a photograph. It's not like trying to get the perfect photograph print on a piece of photogloss paper. I'm actually looking for different types of papers that have different matter gloss finishes, different color tints, different reflectivities to go ahead and enhance the shapes in the photo. So instead of dodging and burning inside Photoshop to make some areas lighter or darker or tinting some areas different than other, inside Photoshop or Lightroom, I'm using paper and different types of paper to be my dodge and burn, to make this area in the middle brighter, to make the area in the lower right darker, etc. So it's a very different process, a mixture of analog with digital. That's really fascinating, Chris. Um, and my question, first of all, I'm amazed that you make your own paper. That's a whole nother obsession, right? <laughs> <laughs> But um, other than that, when you, in order to find the other papers that you use, 
where do you look? I'm guessing that people who haven't been to art school or don't make fine art may not even know that there are these kinds of paper out there. Yeah, there's a wide variety of papers out there, and if you look inside um, an art store in your local town, you will probably find a section dedicated to selling different types of papers. And they might even be called decorative papers or paper for scrapbooking, etc. If you don't have such a store in town, there's several online resources. Um, I really like Phoenix Art Supply, and I also really like a, a place called Paper Mojo, M-O-J-O. And Paper Mojo is maybe one of the easiest to navigate websites because they sort the papers by colors, theme, etc. Oh, that's really cool. Well, you know, the next time you're down here in Boulder, Chris, you have to go to the Two Hands Papery, which has an amazing assortment of these kinds of papers. It's run by a um, friend of mine, Mia Semmingson, and it's really wonderful. Have you been there? I have not been there, but last time I was in town, I was in the bead store that was in Boulder, because that's the other thing I look for is unusual stones, beads, pendants, amulets, to also add to these pieces later. Cool. Go ahead. Anyway, once I have a collage, the trick becomes how do I print the photograph back on top of it. Now, since I'm using the same sheet of paper, I'm relying on the printer to do my registration to line things up. Now, the lower end printer you have, the more it's on you to put the paper back in the printer the same way every time. For example, with our old Epson 2200, which is an old 13-inch wide printer, you had to manually align things. But the newer printers automatically sense where the edges of the paper are, and you can pass the same image through the printer several times, and the registration of image on top of image are pretty good. Wow. This, the second thing that I do is I coat the top of this with an inkjet receptive coating. All inkjet papers you buy have an additional coating put on top of them to make them hold the ink better and also to make sure that the ink doesn't spread. If the ink mm -hmm. spreads, your image becomes softer. So there's a couple different companies out there. One is called um, Digital Art Studio Services, or just DASS, D-A-S-S for short, and they're actually based out of Boulder, in case you didn't. Yeah, you know the folks up there, Jan. And then also there's a place called Golden Acrylics. They make paint for artists. But they also make what they call a digital ground. Ground is a term. Go ahead. Is it interesting? I mean, I used those paints 20 years ago, but it's interesting to yeah. see what other supplies they have. Yeah, they, there's something that they come up with recently to expand the palette of traditional artists. Now, artists call the surface that they paint on the ground. Um, so they refer to these as digital ground. It's a clear fluid or a white fluid that you brush over your finished piece and that will now make it more receptive to inkjet. You'll get more vivid colors, and it'll be sharper because the ink won't run and spread to adjacent pixels. So when that's done, I print on top of collage, and I get this. So this is kind of like a very physical version of using multiply mode. Um, wow. I'm literally, in the physical world, multiplying the photograph on top of the paper collage. Now, how much time do you how much time do you spend actually cutting out or ripping your paper? Because it seems like you've got pretty precise edges with what you had before. I mean, I'm I'm surprised by how how precise you were able to get between the two layers. Yeah, what I did when I made this layer is underneath there, I printed a faint version of this program of this but photograph. How, how long did it take you to rip? Well, something like this one has a lot of complex edges. This one, it probably spends about at least three or four hours tearing up the paper. Wow, okay. And then more time before that selecting the papers. Mm -hmm. Now, I could take an X-Acto knife or even, for that matter, a computer-controlled die cutter or a laser cutter and have it precisely cut these edges. But that wouldn't be the same texture on the edge. Precisely. I'm trying to get the hand of the artist more into these. I'm trying to mm -hmm. get that combination of digital perfection and analog imperfection. So I make a point of hand tearing all these, and I like there being some feathers, soft edges, and imperfections on the edges mm -hmm. just to make it look handcrafted rather than making it look like a digital composite or a digital collage. Mm -hmm. So I've got a question now, too. You mentioned that uh, the more modern printers uh, will line things up, and it seems like you really have to have pretty good registration to make this work for, for what you're doing, correct? Yeah. Um, so wh how do you make it do? I mean, what? You just feed it in and hope? I mean, <laughs> how do you do it? 
<laughs> it depends on what I um. Let's, let's talk briefly about printers. I have three different levels of printer. Um, I have an old Epson 2200. It's a 13 inch printer. It's very stupid, which means I can abuse it and it doesn't care, which is very useful. Um, but it does not know where the paper edges are. So it's up to me to put pieces of tape around the printer and try to line up my paper with those tape edges so I'm from the same starting point every time. Mm -hmm. The two higher level printers I have is an Epson 3880. It's a 17 inch printer and an HP Z3100, which is a 24 inch wide printer. Both of these have sensors built into them where they automatically seek out the top, right, and back edges of the paper to tell where the paper starts and stops, how far shifted to one side it is, and whether or not you've loaded it straight. And if there's too much skew or rotation, they'll kick the paper out and tell you to put it back in straighter this time. Cool. So for the most part, it works for you on those printers. You don't waste a lot of prints and stuff getting it right? No, I very rarely have to get rid of something because of registration problems. And to be honest, if I do have a registration problem, I sometimes go back in and touch up these edges the transitions between the shapes with things such as pastels, um, either the, mm -hmm. the uh, soft pastel or the oil pastels, with paints, with pens, etc., to strengthen the edges and, and redefine where that edge is. Mm -hmm. the, uh, one other thing I want to make clear, which every photographer should know, but again I want to emphasize it particularly for artists, is you have to get a printer that uses um, pigments, not dyes, because mm -hmm. pigments are light fast. You know, I want these things to last for as long as someone cares to have it on their wall. If you use a cheaper dye-based printer, colors, like particularly the magenta, may fade within a few years of sunlight. So that's one important distinction between printers. See, I haven't even gone into printing myself yet. I'm still using outside printers, and so this is just fascinating to me. Yeah, that, that's one of the big things is a pigment-based printer, pigment being the same thing that gets mixed into watercolors, oil paints, mm -hmm. and other traditional artist materials. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is a case where you just can't just go and just reprint a new copy when the old one fades, because because of what you're it's printing. It's an art. Out. It's a yeah. yeah. It's a... Oh yeah, these are these are one-offs. They're one of ones. Mm -hmm. These are not reproductions. Um, mm -hmm. I'd have to collage the whole thing up again um, to create these things. So it, and it is nail-biting moment when it goes through the printer because yeah, how, you hope how, that... how do you have the pieces affixed to together so they don't you know, like come apart in the you know, it, when it's going through the printer itself. Yeah, I've been through a lot of different, um, a lot of different adhesives to see what works best. The one that I'm using right now is something called Roll Attack, as an R O L L dash A dash T A Q, and it's a roller system that puts on a very very thin layer of adhesive onto the back of these papers, and then when I stick them down, I use a lot of force with some sort of roller, like a brayer roller, etc., to really stick these down hard onto the paper and let the, the glue set. The other thing that's extremely important is that I sit these things underneath weights overnight to get the paper as flat as possible. Um, if the paper How much overlap is there between the pieces that you have on top of each other, or are you trying to more butt them up against each other? Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to butt them up against each other. I'm trying not to overlap. Now, there are some papers, like these very thin Chinese rice papers, that will give me some flexibility. I'll, I'll tear too wide, kind of like the equivalent of overspraying or overprinting. Put them down first, and then I'll put opaque papers on top. But I, I try to line up the edges as close as I can to them. Um, the other thing that's really important in printer choices is Epson and HP have a major difference in how thick of a piece of paper you can put through them. Mm -hmm. um, HP printers are more finicky. They can only put about 0.7 mils through them, whereas with an Epson printer, you can get up to one and a half mils through them. Wow. So for for collage work, an Epson's a better better choice. I have one more question, and then I promise we'll let you go on. You mentioned <laughs> that you coat uh, the coating you use is from the uh, DOS Digital Art Studios, um, which is I believe owned by my friend Bonnie Nahota. Is that right? Yes. And so um, they offer different super sauces. Is that what you're using, super sauce? I am not using super sauce. Um, there's two types of um, magic sauces that Bonnie makes up at DOS. 
One is for when you're inkjet printing directly onto the paper. And she refers to that as a digital um, digital ground. And the same thing, that's what uh, Golden calls it too. If instead of printing through the printer, if instead you want to do what's called a transfer, where you first print to a transparency, then transfer the ink from the transparency onto your paper, that's where you need her so-called super sauce. That's what that's for. I see. So if I wanted to do what you're doing, what is the name of the stuff? Um, you want to either use her, she calls it digital inkjet pre-coat, or it. you get from um, Golden what they refer to as digital grounds. Terrific. And I just I want to do a shout out to Bonnie Lahoda. She is an amazing artist, and she has been doing um, prints similar, you know, I won't say similar to what you're doing, but um, experimenting with printers um, and how they interact with post-processing applications like Photoshop for many years. She was one of the first people to ever do it. And she is a great artist. She gives classes. She has DVDs. And she also sells these products. Um, and I, I, I think she's a great person. Hopefully we'll have her on the show too. Yeah, actually Bonnie was co-author of one of the first books I read on this subject called um, Digital Art Studio, which really got me into this approach. And Bonnie has several other books out there which will help educate people on this concept of printing on unusual surfaces, unusual substrates. Um, the best tip out of her book is out of her Digital Alchemy book, she shows you how to build what she calls a slot ruler. It's two pieces of metal with a gap in between that matches your printhead gap on your printer. Mm. And the trick is, if you can put it through the slot ruler, it'll go through your printer. Ooh, if, i got to try that. That's cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If it hangs up on the slot ruler, it's not going to go through your printer, and you're, you'll get a head strike where the head actually hits the paper and... Um, Worst case, ruin, best case ruins the print. Worst case ruins the printer. Oh, uh, you're making but, me want to borrow to 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 rent one of these printers or to <laughs> borrow a friend's printer. And I I have not trashed a printer yet, so you know it's not that scary. Um, flatten things before they go through and start with a cheap printer, like an Epson 2400 or something like that. You know, cheap cheap being five or six hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. That's uh, not too bad in yeah. the grand scheme of photography equipment. You know what, yeah. Erica? I've got one that's been sitting in the closet for a while, and I'd be willing to sell it to you cheap. So let me know. <laughs> <laughs> you come out this way sometimes, too. We might be able to strike a deal here. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay, go ahead, Chris. What then? <laughs> no problem. So after I have this print where I've printed this photograph on top of this collage to come up with this sandwich, this overprint, I will then mount this mess, this piece of paper, onto a wooden panel or something else that's very stiff. Now, what I've used for my ground, my backing, is I actually use printmaking paper. The uh, brand I've been using a lot lately is called Reeves, R-I-V-E-S-B-F-K. Um, I have no idea what that acronym stands for. But it's a printmaker's paper that's used to getting wet and then going back to its original shape. So when I get it wet to glue things on top or get it wet to put the digital ground on top, it then relaxes and goes back to a fairly flat piece of paper, making it easier to flatten to get through the printer. I've tried making these collages on top of photo paper. A lot of photo papers do not like to get wet. And, they get and aren't very... they thicker, too? Um, there's different thicknesses of these papers, and they okay. will come in different weights. And again, this comes back to what is your printer's head gap spacing and what can you get through it. I had to go to thinner papers like the Reeves printmaking paper to get it through the smaller gap of my HP printer. Uh, when I'm using the Epson with a wide gap, I can go ahead and just use um, watercolor paper, which is a bit thicker. Very cool. Okay. I'll then glue these onto wood panels. And, and a little bit later on, I'll actually, when I'm back on camera, I'll show you what these panels look like. And I've been using a type of glue that book binders use called Pro-Macto, P-R-O-M-A-C-T-O. It's really thick. It's almost as thick as peanut butter. And the reason that's useful is it's not very wet. It doesn't have a high water content, so your paper's less likely to because it was, has this adhesive slathered onto it. Mm -hmm. I'll slather that onto the panel, roll it out thin with a foam roller like you'd use for your house to put trim around your windows, lay this on top, and then put underneath very heavy weights for at least a day to adhere as flat as possible. Mm -hmm. And then when I'm done, 
I then do other bits of adhesive and other, well, different bits of, of dormant to the final image. This was the image in the final with me adding some additional decorations. For example, I decided that the center was a bit too stark and I didn't like the balance. Mm -hmm. So I added an additional piece of paper to the center and put it underneath a, a sheet of mica just to add a little bit of interest to the middle of it. But in general, I'm really trying to create things that look like, um, like old artifacts, something you might find on an archaeological dig and you might think was a ritualistic object for somebody. So I really try to create the idea of, of an ofrendo, a sort of um, altar piece, where I'll use different types of sticks, wood, and metal to make bars across them and dangle different amulets, beads, stones, etc. from them to heighten the lines. Like here, I'm really trying to work on building a line between... I don't know if you see my cursor when I'm actually moving my cursor through this. A little bit. Yeah. The copper beads in the upper right corner, I actually try to align them so the two of them then point to the amulet to the left. And I also try to line up other imaginary lines as your eye goes through this mm -hmm. piece. For example, the small bead underneath the amulet to the left goes through the center of the spiral and lands you on this bead to the right. Mm -hmm. So I'm really using a lot of the principles of good design of how a painter would try to lead your eye through a painting. But instead of painting it that way, it's my choice of photograph and then my choice of adornment later, what some people call assemblage, to add these elements on top of it later on. Well, you know, you've been so generous telling, you how, telling us how you do these, but I'm imagining you spend a lot of time thinking about the story behind each one too, right? Yeah, a lot of these do have stories, because as I say, I'm trying to create things that look like they're artifacts. I, I joke, I'm not trying to create works of art, but I'm trying to create objects that you would look at and say, there's a story here. This meant something to somebody. They built this for a particular reason. And let me go back to um, some other ones just to show you some other ones I've done. Like, this was a rock also, an Escalante. I saw this rock and I said, that's a person there. <laughs> this is along the left uh -huh. side. Oh, I can see it. Yeah. So from there, I created a collage. Again, heightening the photograph. And I actually went ahead and scanned in an old book on a story of how coyotes stole fire from the, the old ladies who were protecting it and brought it back to the humans and put it inside the shape that looked like a person, created a collage of different papers, including some very bright metallic papers. This is metallic gold paint and metallic copper paint sprayed on top of mulberry paper. Mm -hmm. And I've also bought commercial papers that have what's known as oracle bone script. It's a very early um, form of oriental writing that's very pictograph oriented, and the symbols look very, very similar to rock art symbols as well. When they're printed together, and then with the assemblage, that's the final piece. But again, it's a matter of starting with, I see a person. Um, I see an old person. Okay, I need to start looking up stories of old people. All right, uh, old people and rocks. Let's talk about old people and creation stories. That what leads me to research things like, what is this story about how you know, one of the major elements, fire, was brought to people from the gods that had it? And that's the type of thought process I go through when I try to create these pieces. Um, this is another one called Understanding Birds. This is actually a cliff face along Lake Powell. Um, already had really interesting lines and some colorations to it. Really bumped it up, rotated it a bit. Really interesting strong lines, shapes to it. This is me sketching out on the piece of paper ahead of time where I see those shapes. Now you get an idea of that light print that I make on a piece of paper to give me an idea of where to actually collage my pieces. Here's me testing the collage before I actually commit to gluing things down. Um, I had a very bright piece of uh, polar metallic paper, one of my favorite print papers, that ended up not working there at all. This was a piece that the printer ate, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it went through the printer, it got folded over on itself, I put it in a drawer and I was depressed for a year about it. Um, but I put it underneath weights and kept tugging out the folds. Eventually got everything nice and flat again. This is the final print. I managed to salvage the piece. Now the funny thing is, is after I printed it, I said, I do not like the artistic balance of this piece. Um, this bright section in the middle is just too centered. It doesn't follow the rule of thirds of where to put the interest. I really wanted to put my focal point on this diagram of birds in the upper left and said, well, if I put my focal point up here, now I have a very unbalanced piece. I have too much, particularly along the bottom of this. 
So I then chopped off the bottom of it, added an additional bar on the left so I could move my focal point over to the typical photographic third that we try to aim things at. And this is me laying out the sticks and the bees and the feathers to try to make the final piece. So. That's very cool. but we've been Yeah, but we've been talking about analog. Let's actually go into the digital world here a little bit. Um, I've talked about this stuff at Escalante. Uh, people who visit Arizona, there's a nice little town called Jerome. It's an old mining town converted into an artist town. As you leave Jerome on the 89A, there's these most amazing rock formations along the side of the road that have these amazing colors and shapes to them. And I, first time I went, it was snowing, so it was kind of hard to take photos. The second time I went back, my wife was literally across the road warning me, car! Because <laughs> this was a narrow rock cut through a mountain to get to Prescott, Arizona. And there was <laughs> barely a two-foot shoulder in a lot of these places. So no time to take three nice lined up photos for HDR. Mm -hmm. I had to take photos, dodge cars, take a photo, dodge a car. <laughs> but it gives me an idea of some of the raw material. They're beautiful. Now this spring, I was up in um, Capitol Reef, which is one of our lesser known national parks. No, and it's the best one. It's amazing, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> I love Capitol Reef. It's outside Torrey, Utah. It has amazing variety of geology. Everything from hoodoos to slot canyons to petroglyphs, and it's completely underrun. No one goes there. It's empty. I love it out there. And this was one of the canyons out there called Headquarters Canyon. And this gives an idea again of what I'm looking for when I'm out following these canyons. Now, here's a canyon wall. Here's the JPEG image that came off the camera. Here's the camera raw image, and I'll actually be diving into camera raw here in a second. But in addition to that, there were some really interesting rocks along the creek bed that this canyon formed that had all sorts of interesting lichen and other interesting dots on them. And these ended up being interesting sources. I mean, the canyon walls are fascinating. But eventually, we started looking down as much as we did up to find, let me get some really interesting patterns that were along the ground of you know, these very strange formations of the rock through the ages and the lichen. So when I have an image like this, I'll take the camera raw version. Let's see what we're going to play with. I'm going to play with one of these because I want to take a challenge here to show you what you can do with camera raw. I'm going to go ahead and open the camera raw. And when you see a photo like this in the wild, and particularly when you see the camera raw image, which tends to be a bit washed out and undersaturated, you may think, there's very little source material here. But by using Camera Raw, where you have all this color information that hits your sensor now saved in your card, there's a lot of subtle colors lurking underneath the surface in nature. And the Camera Raw dialog allows you to pull those colors out. For example, what looks like black lichen dots are not pure black. They usually actually have a color tint to them. And one of the principles of painters is they tend not to use the color black out of a tube. They use what's called rich black, where they mix a black by combining different colors. And nature, as it turns out, has a lot of rich blacks as well, and it's a lot of fun to pull that out. So let's go ahead and fit this in view. I'll go through a typical session of trying to tease stuff out of these images. The first thing I do, particularly with the camera raw image, is I bump up the contrast. And by doing so, immediately you start to see some enhanced saturation in the image and more contrast now where you actually have whites, grays, and blacks rather than just a washed out image. I'll do a little bit of adjustment of the exposure just to get a little bit brighter to see what I'm working with. This and is then, fascinating because it's so different than the processes that I use. Oh, yeah. Well, I've stumbled <laughs> along through this. Um, I will admit to having learned camera raw mostly on my own because in the old days there were not a lot of books on Camera Raw. Um, so I just took it one panel at a time and mm -hmm. just mastered it that way. I started on just this basic panel for a year mm -hmm. before I started moving to other panels and learning more and getting that underneath my belt. So one word is don't get intimidated by all these different choices and all these different panels and all these different sliders. Start with a basic panel, get comfortable with that, then move on to the other panels and what you can do with those. 
And it's interesting that you say, I'll admit that I learned on my own. How else would you learn? I mean, honestly, <laughs> um, all of us, those people who make the living teaching everybody else, we learned on our own. I mean, there isn't, you know, it hasn't been around for long enough that there is an established body of work and knowledge like going to college and learning, you know, the classics of literature. You have to learn on your own, and it's very admirable, and what you do with it is amazing. Oh, I've only just begun here too, Jan. Um, <laughs> and you'll see, I, since I am working abstractly, I'm not trying to create realistic skin tones. Right, I'm and it, it's fascinating to me because I, the very first thing I do is I always tell people I never, ever adjust the contrast lighter. So it's interesting <laughs> that the very first thing you do when you get in here is like, I bump the contrast. And so yeah. it's just showing that there is no wrong. And yeah. it's just fascinating to me to see that. So yeah. go ahead, bump it all the way and show me what else you do. <laughs> yeah, for, for what I'm trying to do is, yeah, I'm trying to get value changes, and different yeah. lights and darks. I'm trying to get color changes. So I may not end up at 100% contrast, but I'll start here just to give me an idea of what's lurking in this image. A um, little bit of exposure just to go ahead and see what I've got. And then I'll use the clarity slider fairly early in the process to get an idea of whether or not I want to go sharp and defined, where I get even more contrast in the image, or defocus the color and go for more of a soft pastel treatment. So I'm using the clarity slider as almost like a choice in medium of whether or not I want a softer image or a sharp, highly contrasted image. Well, this is a question, I guess, more, more for Jan. Um, with the, the, the sliders here in Camera Raw and Lightroom, are they essentially identical in function now? Um, yes, yes. Okay. At least these basic sliders are. And almost everything in Camera Raw, they have a few more bells, different bells and whistles, but the general engine under the two is doing the same thing. Yeah, and it's it's and I am working with the latest um, camera raw update, including these abilities to directly drag the slider in the histogram for exposure, highlights, shadows, etc. And for people who don't have a good feeling yet for what highlights and shadows really mean, I would suggest going ahead and updating to the latest Creative Cloud update for, for raw, because just being able to look into the histogram in the upper right corner and seeing, oh. This is the band of values that are being adjusted by shadows. Will give you a better idea of what those sliders are doing down below. Can you can you adjust? Can you can you? Um, I, I can't. I don't have the mouse over what I'm trying to explain. Can you pull, <laughs> push and pull in that histogram at the top in Adobe Camera Raw like you can in Lightroom? I'm not a Lightroom user, so I can't answer that. But you can push and now, and it's a new feature. In RAW, now you can do it in the histogram without using the slider. OK, that's what I was curious about. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> and the interesting thing is, is that you actually get finer increments for exposure by dragging in the histogram than you do using the exposure slider. Can, can you do it for the, same, for the individual uh, RGB channels in the histogram as well? Or is it? Good question. I haven't tried that yet. I, I just, I just a question popped into my mind. Huh? Yeah. Um, I I'm guessing seen. that the only way you can access those is in the tone curve, okay. which is another panel. Yeah. But you should. But that would affect, uh, you know, the what you're seeing in the histogram. It just wouldn't be. Yeah. You can do it from the histogram. Anyway, let's get back to this for a second. <laughs> like we're getting wonky. All right. <laughs> so many great tangents to go down, but I want to go through a process because I said, you know, I'm not trying to go for reality here. I'm trying to create create something new and abstract out of this. Um, color temperature is very useful. Um, since I am shooting in a variety of lighting conditions outdoors, I just leave it for auto white balance when I'm out shooting because I'm literally going from shadows to light, shooting red rocks, shooting green foliage. But then I'll come in raw and really play with the temperature to decide what color range I want to go for. Do I want to go for a very cool slate blue sort of feel like this? Or do I want to go for a very warm, you know, hot reds and oranges look like this? So I will use temperature rather than the hue to decide which way I want to go with this piece. I'll use temperature primarily and then tint as a follow-up to decide whether or not to, again to get more of that magenta tone in there or take it to a little bit more neutral of a yellow tone. It's interesting to see, to watch the histogram adjust as you're pulling the, the sliders. Oh, the histogram is just a fantastic tool to educate you on what these things are doing. Um, particularly for people who are relatively new to this and this seems like a mystery, 
watch that histogram in addition to the image to the left because it will really educate you on what you're doing with each of these sliders. Well, that was cool. Yeah, that was nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, now I need to go up a level from here. I need to start getting more color into this image. And I'll use a combination of vibrance and saturation. And quite often, um, you'll see text tell you, use vibrance, don't use saturation. Vibrance is more subtle, saturation clips. But I've actually found that the two sliders have very different color tendencies. I find that vibrance does a very nice job with oranges and reds, but it tends to clip out purples and magentas and make them look harsh prematurely. On the other hand, saturation tends to have a very nice effect on magentas and purples. You'll see it's much more subtle in that range, but it tends to clip out oranges and reds and make them look garish much more quickly. Mm -hmm. So I'm actually using vibrance and saturation as two different tone controls when not I need to bump the oranges in the image or bump with subtlety the blues and the magentas and the purples inside the image and balance them off. You know, I've seen that before. I remember uh, seeing a video by Julianne Cost once where she was dragging them in opposite directions and getting really interesting effects that way. Have you tried that? Oh, yeah, you can go ahead and do some desaturation too. And sometimes I'll go that direction as well. An important interaction between what I'm doing in Photoshop and what I'm doing with the printer is since I'm printing on less than perfect printing papers, the colors do not transfer as accurately as they would with a normal piece of photo gloss. So I need to over amp my contrast and my saturation a little bit at this stage to get closer to what I actually want printed on the paper because I'm using imperfect papers when I do the print. Ah, uh, that's interesting how you've compensated. Yeah, so I kind of mentally overdo it here so that I, knowing that the paper's not going to give me everything that I want. Mm -hmm. Once I've come up with a basic color scheme for a piece, then I'm looking at my highlights and my shadows and just trying to maximize my contrast. And again, a lot of interesting thing, things can happen. For example, I can go ahead and boost the exposure, but if I'm getting some details in the white spots of the, the um, lichen on this rock, I'll get back the detail in my highlights by pulling down the highlight slider. So I'm still getting the very top whites, but I'm keeping definition in those whites by pulling back on the highlights. Mm -hmm. and that's, an, that's an interesting tension that I'll use quite often. Is um, Sometimes if I want to puff out highlights, I'll go ahead and crank up the highlights, but quite often I'm pulling down the highlight slider to get detail in these white areas. Yeah, I'll go ahead and put this out to zero. We see where they blow out. But then I'll use the white slider and the exposure to get actually the degree of brightness I want in this image. And again, with the blacks, I can go ahead and decide where I want my black point to be on this. And again, we're not to pull stuff out of shadows. And this is another reason I happen to love shooting in camera raw. It's quite often out in nature. I don't have the option of waiting for shadows to come around. For example, I've got a shadow on the left here where this ledge is. If I want to see detail there, I can just pull up a bit more in the shadow slider to get color back in there, and then pull down my blacks to darken the image back again. And you can't do that with the JPEG. You really need to shoot in camera raw to get that. And you can't do that with a people picture either. They get really wonky looking. <laughs> <laughs> and again, that's just the... Just your face. <laughs> that, and that's uh, the fun, fun of doing abstract. Oh, Chris, it's wonderful. Up, oh, sorry. Do you end up using the local adjustment brushes very much, or do you just stick with the basic sliders mostly? I stick with the basic sliders. I don't use local adjustments, but what I will do is I will go into HSL, and if I see something that I needs boosting, um, let's say I decide that the blue needs to be comped up even more, I'll go ahead and tackle the individual RGB CMYK in here to boost or pull back individual color ranges, or if necessary, shift them. Uh, quite yeah. often, green foliage, you know, if there's a plant that comes across this image, I've done all of this work really kicking up the saturation and vibrance and the contrast, the foliage tends to look terrible. So quite often I'll go into here, go after the greens and pull down their saturation or shift them to a different color so they don't look as garish. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes, if I'm having trouble with my contrast, I will then go into tone curve to go ahead and sculpt my mid uh, shadows and my mid highlights a little bit more. I try to get by using these sliders, but if I can't solve a problem with these sliders, 
then I'll go into the tone curve and, and push a little bit harder to try to get what I want. It's interesting because I never, I never bump the contrast, but I always make at least an S curve here on the tone curve. Yeah, and you know, it does have some good presets to start out with. Um, I found it for what I do more expedient to just start yes. with the contrast slider because it's one control instead of several mm -hmm. to, see, to see if there's any promise in the image. Because when I take home my few hundred shots after a day of shooting, I'll go into ones that look promising and open them in camera raw and just do some quick adjustments to say, is there potential in this image or not? And if I go, oh, wait, there's not, I'll toss it. But um, I need a quick way of seeing, is there something to work with this in this image? And so that's why I'll use these coarse sliders first, then go are into there, things like the tone. Are there presets that you can save in ACR? You know, it, there are presets. Um, I have rarely found one set of treatments that work well across images. I can probably do quite a bit by just saying contrast 100 and a little bit more exposure and things like that, but I end up just hand tweaking every one of these. Okay, thank you guys. Both answered my question. Jan by nodding and you by answering that you don't use them and why. So it worked out well. <laughs> no. Split toning, I'll use at the very end of the process. Something that's very important to me is going to the lens corrections and there's a few different reasons for that. One, I always remove chromatic aberration. <laughs> um, particularly, I'm printing these pieces fairly large, like mm -hmm. up to 16 by 20, up to 20 by 30. So any problems like a bit of chromatic aberration, some strange green or oh, magenta. Oh, it shows edges, up on printing so much more than on the screen. Yes, it does. Um, so I, I have a post-it note on my monitor to always check remove chromatic aberration. If I have time, I zoom in closely on the image and try to do some better tweaking, but this mm -hmm. is, every image needs this. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll sometimes use my camera profile to go ahead and get rid of some of the lens vignetting, but quite often I'm doing manual adjustments because I'm trying to make something artistic out of this. Yeah. I'll press V to get my grid up, set my grid line, and start looking at things like how do I line up these cracks in the rock to be nice horizontal lines for an abstract composition. I've got a fairly straight line here in the middle, but in this upper third, the line is ascending to the right. So I might start actually tilting the image a bit to try mm -hmm. to either give more stretch to that line or flatten it out a little bit, and then rotate it a little bit to try to get a little bit more onto a horizontal, like around there. Interesting. And, and if necessary, I'll go ahead and even pinch in bend that line to where I want it to be. So I'm not strictly trying to get rid of camera distortion. I'm trying to slightly distort the image to again to make it more match what you want. Yeah. precisely, make it more graphical, etc. Um, and then I will do my vignetting over in the effects dialog. Because quite often I'm not printing these things full frame. I might cut this one down to say a square image. I'll just go ahead and pull this up quickly. I do indeed show the, the thirds overlay to help me compose the shot. I wish Adobe Camera Raw had the same choices as Photoshop did to either show the golden mean overlay or the thirds overlay. You can. Can't you hit um, O? Mm. Is it, is it no. O or is, is it I? It works in, there is a, there is a way to do it. Um, is it O that you hit, Jan? I don't know. Um, I to, to, to rotate through all of the different cropping options, I think I just hit O over and over again, and I can go through, and it will go through the golden spiral, it will go through um, big grid, small grid, it will go through all of those things. I use them all the time. And that's how it works in Lightroom. I don't know for Camera Raw. It does okay. not in Raw. Oh, that sucks. Sorry. <laughs> Another yeah, reason to switch to Lightroom. <laughs> that's one downside. But here you see now, you know, I'm just doing this very quickly. I've got yeah. this line by my third. It's fairly straight now. I've got a bit of a composition. Then That's I'll beautiful. go into the effects dialog and say, okay, now let's start adding in vignetting. Because to an artist, vignetting is good. You, <laughs> want to, <laughs> you want to focus the viewer's attention into the middle of your piece, not necessarily remove the lens artifact of vignetting. It's like a different approach again. So I'll overamp this to see what I'm doing. I'll play with the roundness to get the shape that I want. I quite often move the midpoint just to push it a little further to the edges, and then I'll back off in the amount just to get a little bit of darkening yeah. those corners to where it's subtle. And this is without, and suddenly that looks very strange, <laughs> and with. And this is something that painters spend a lot of time carefully trying to 
grade eight into their paintings and scrape this a couple sliders inside <laughs> Adobe Camera Raw. <laughs> and um, that's the real quick tour of how I would treat one of these images in Raw. And let's go back again. I'll just cancel out of this. You know, this was the original image. <laughs> wow. <Whoa. laughs> That's terrific. Awesome. So, you know, I, I understand we're coming to the end of the show, so I want to be sure that people know that um, you've been picked up by a number of galleries, right? I am primarily in one gallery in Albuquerque called the Gallery ABQ, but I've also been exhibiting in a lot of other places. I'll actually be in a show in another gallery in town called the Weirich Gallery. Um, for their December show. That was an invitation-only show, and I'm glad to get into that. For those who happen to live in Albuquerque, I'll be the Encantada 2013 show. But, you know, this is currently my other career in addition to doing video professionally, but I'm trying to make this more of my full-time career, what we call the long crossfade from one career to another career. It's a challenge. And, it's a challenge. Yeah, and I am indeed actively seeking out other galleries, but I'm having a lot of fun doing this and teaching others how to do it. It sounds so fun, and there are so many pieces to it. It's photography, it's art, it's Photoshop, um, it's, it's, it's collage. <laughs> it's yeah, these, these are the panels I was talking about, the cradled panels. Okay. That the pieces get mounted onto. Beautiful. So that's what a piece would look Beautiful. like. Beautiful. So I have to tell you, Chris, the next time you come here, we're going down to my basement. I've got all this stuff. I used to be so into this, and then I got, you know taken away into this, as, as you know how you, you focus on one part of your career and not the other, but I'm very eager to get back to it, and I'll tell you guys out there, there is nothing better than getting your hands on something. You know, isn't that right, Chris? It's fantastic to get your hands on it, and, and the other thing I'm trying to avoid is you, there is a lot of bad digital art out there. There is a lot of bad Photoshop collages out there. There's a lot of other people, of course, none of you who watch this program, who <laughs> take an image apply a filter in Photoshop like find edges and declare it art and say how dare you not say this is art just because it's the computer. Well no it's not because or you, you did or did not use a computer it's because whether or not you brought any artistic focus to the piece. So I'm really trying to combine my digital knowledge but traditional art concepts and bring it into the mix it with the photographic and the digital printing world and come up with something new, a, a hybrid. Wonderful. And I also really appreciate the southwestern feel of the pieces. And um, yeah. every time I see them, I think, you know, for those of us who live in this very small corner of the world, um, it looks familiar. But I'm also thinking maybe in New York and San Francisco and Europe, they don't know from this. And there would be a place to explore, right? Yeah. Well, let me show you also. I mean, I lived in California for ages. And out in California, it's very different influence. It's the Pacific Rim mm -hmm. influence in addition to Africa and et cetera. So this is kind of a piece that reflects more of my Japanese influence when I lived in L.A., where I'm using definitely the old Oriental scripts, um, more of a wabi-sabi sort of feel overall to the piece. So I did go back and forth, but definitely since I moved to New Mexico, I, I picked up a very different aesthetic out here, and I've really, really enjoyed it. Well, we've really enjoyed seeing your work, and... Um I just thank you so much for sharing it with us and being generous about telling us how you do it. You know, I think a lot of people are scared. Oh my gosh, if I tell people, then it won't be, you know, they'll do it and then I'll be. No, it doesn't work that way with art, right? No, everyone comes up with, you know, everyone has a different internal vision. I can show you how I use the tools. And I know a lot of you were probably gasping because I was using the tools differently than you would normally use them for normal, quote unquote, uh, photographic work. But then at the end of the day, it's just a tool to realize what's inside you and your vision. Exactly true. And your vision is fantastic. So I think we're just about at the end of the show, right, Dave? Yes, um, I think I think so. Uh, so again, I want to thank Dave. I want to thank you for running the show for us in Ron Clifford's absence. Ron will be back next week. He's doing some photographing in some wonderful place in Canada. Um, and Erica, as usual, you're a terrific guest and really contributed to the conversation. And I like you a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you. I always and, uh, have lots uh, of questions. Ron, Ron asked me to mention, uh, to remind everyone that uh, in our next show, we'll have Dan Hughes from uh, Nick, Google, Nick, uh, which is part of Google now, and that if you are in the chat room, you'll have a chance to win a, uh, a complete Nick, Nick software suite. So you'll want to join us live for our next show, possibly uh, get on winning a good chunk of software there. That's right, and that's going to be October 8th. We're doing an extra show. We usually only broadcast every two weeks, but this is an extra show in between because 
we want to make we want to make sure that everybody has access to this um, opportunity to win the entire suite of Nick's Nick slash Google software, and that means Silver Effects Pro, Color Effects Pro, HDR Effects Pro, the what's it called Vivisa. Mm -hmm. And I'm probably missing something else, but it's just such a great opportunity. And plus, we get to talk with Dan Hughes and Lori Rubin, two fantastic um, friends of ours from Google, Nick. So thank you again, Chris Meyer. And please come visit me again, or I'll come down there and see you, because I'm very excited about what you're doing. Um, and also, don't forget, guys, that Chris is a great resource for After Effects. And After Effects is terrific. If you need to learn it, go visit his courses on lynda.com. Thanks. All right then. Anything else from anybody? We're good. All right, we're good. We got to play. We we have to get some theme music to play at the end of the show. <laughs> That's so here, drum roll. Thank you so much, everyone, for staying with Thanks, us. Thanks, everybody. Bye bye. Thank you.